Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's next study in the articles that are currently before us. As we address these articles and progress through them, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction and seek his blessing as we open his word to more rightly divide the word of truth. Shall we also pray for those that cannot be with us today and seek to learn that which we need at this time? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, there is much yet that we need to understand. There is much guidance that we need. There is much correction that we are receiving. We thank you, Father, for your guidance and your direction. We thank you for your admonitions and for the fires that are ongoing, so that we may be in, indeed purified of that which we have allowed. Please forgive us of our sins. Be with us now in this study. Help us to express, direct, and be guided in all that you would have us to understand. May your angels surround us. May your spirit enlighten our minds. Be with those that are not here at this meeting. Help us now, each one, so that as we participate and those that will view this later may find you glorified. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. There were points that Theodore was addressing at the end of yesterday's meeting. Now, I brought this article from yesterday back up for a reason. We're going to take a very brief amount of time to go through this a second time, kind of as an overview, because I have questions. And the questions are going to center on the first sentence of this article. This sentence reads, in this article, we are going to consider the issue of the daily. This is a statement I'm going to ask directly of all that were here yesterday. As we covered this article, was the premise considering the issue of the daily clearly delineated? Or is there quite a bit more that needs to be addressed? And yes, I'm going to be asking for input. I'm going to ask for participation on this across the board. Well, he went into a lot of sort of like an application with Samson. Okay. And uh, Lion. That was uh, the riddle there, which Theodore expressed that it, he sort of, there wasn't any root to it. There wasn't any substantial backing up from what he was saying. And I do get that point because you could have made any application. You could have said it could have been like the Jesuits as well, kind of going underground you know, around the time of the French Revolution and then um, making their doctrine of the Catholic Church sweet. So there, there's like several applications you could make. And he made it to the daily. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't really remember all the details from yesterday, but uh, I think we we know. I, I don't know how well he explained the daily. I think did he? I think he mentioned earlier writings, page seventy four. He does. Or Alamites. and um, so that's quite a, a significant evidence for the daily being paganism. Also, we could also look at the, the charts with the, in there as well, 508. Um, I don't think he went into like the, uh, the 508, the, the 1335 and stuff. I'm not too sure how he backed that up. Maybe he touched on it, but not, not maybe in any great detail that I remember. Okay. So can it be said that he laid the groundwork for his case, or did he not provide a good grounding, a good groundwork for his case? Did he did he make an establishment to make this 
clear? Um, probably could have done better. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as I look at these, as I consider these articles, he touches on this point that the old view of paganism renders the daily as a satanic power. And the new view of the daily renders it as Christ's high priestly ministry or a godly power. Now, I was intrigued as I'm as I'm trying to prepare for something else to find that Fulcrum 7, an Adventist publication, makes it entirely clear that in their minds, this is nothing more than the daily sacrifice that needed to occur according to the Mosaic law. They place it as nothing else. Therefore, they would have more in agreement with many of the other churches that are saying that this is a godly power. Now, Mrs. White made it very clear in an article that we were not to make the daily a test question. But does that mean that we should not understand the daily and understand its role in the interpretation of Bible prophecy? Well, a lot of the times when she, she mentioned sort of similar statements, she kind of verified it or, or sort of added that it was not quite yet that time to make it an issue. And generally it was established at that time anyway that it was paganism was the general understanding. So in later years now, that understanding has changed. So I think it's, it's good to go back and say, okay, this is now a changed understanding of what the daily is. Therefore, I believe it is a legitimate time to to look into what the daily is. Okay. Now, with this, he chooses to segue to understand the full scope of the daily, as he states. And he quotes Judges 14, at least a couple of portions of Judges 14, 14 to 18, which is known as Samson's Riddle. Now, he does a fair job going through this particular point, but he is making the application of out of Samson's riddle that this honey that Samson chooses to eat and that he chooses to share with his parents came out of an unclean animal. And according to the Mosaic law, it should not have been eaten. And the case here seems to be laid out that this would be the same thing as accepting biblical interpretation that is not coming from God. At least that's the way that I would look at this. Now, as he continued to segue through this, he makes this as a type. Okay. Thank you, brother. In the chat, the uh, there's a post that goes right back to the article that I was referencing from Fulcrum 7. What is the daily in Daniel? Eight. So, here again, should you have time, take a look at this article, see what your thoughts would be. So, is there a part two? Interesting. You didn't find it. Okay. So, I don't know that I, I still have that up, but I'll go looking for it. Now, <clears throat> here, okay, so you found part four. Great. Here, the author chooses to give reference to Daniel 11.31, 12.11, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 8. Would this be proper Bible study in giving reference only to these verses? Take all of them that was on the subject and bring them together. That would be correct. Now, has, has he done that? Has the uh, author... Yeah. Go I, ahead. Think it, I think it's more than this, that. I would agree. Because in this in this particular case, 
if we were to go back to look at this in reference to where Daniel is addressing us, we would have to start in Daniel 8, verse 7. Because by verse 11, we have this mention, this first mention, as the translators would see it, that states, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice, supplied word, was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. In Daniel 8.12, And an host was given him against the daily by reason of transgression, and it cast down truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So it's great that verses 31 and then 1211 are given reference here, but it's not bringing all of the verses together. Here again, Theodore's comment was this is giving and stating that there's a reason for us to use Miller's rules, but is not using all of Miller's rules in the manner in which they are offered. Does that make sense? Can we agree with that? Now, the whole concept of the daily, be it old or new, is something that replaces something else. Now, as it is noted in the chat, the comment that was made from part three of the article presented by Fulcrum 7, it states that the idea that the daily is paganism or pagan Rome is a holdover from pre-1844 Millerite movement. It is time for Adventists to move on. I'm actually kind of surprised that the, at this in Fulcrum 7 because they're usually pretty solid on things um, and, and amazing discoveries I mean that's uh, they're they're pushing Turkey as king of the north I mean I'm just really surprised that, that these things are usually so solid but they're making such errors it's hard to believe but not really but amazing discoveries, especially that's uh, isn't that uh, uh, Walter Weiss? No, it's not Walter Weiss. Amazing discoveries is I don't it's, remember. Um, somebody called Matthew Sanchez and Mackenzie Trevitt are the main presenters. Yeah, no, I mean they're the presenters. But amazing discoveries is a ministry of Walter Weiss. Yes. Well, he used to be he used to be associated with it, but he's he hasn't done anything with them for about two or three years. Oh, his uh, okay. his ministry is now called Clash of Minds. Oh, okay, yeah, because I, I I remember meeting Walter Weiss at a camp meeting and talking with him about some things, and and uh, you know he believes the twenty five twenty and so on. And he just takes the position that it's divisive, so he doesn't use it in his presentations, but he definitely supports Millerite historic understanding of doctrines. Okay. The old view teaches that paganism was in place as Satan's primary weapon against God's people, but has now been replaced by papalism for the same purpose. The new view teaches that Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary was replaced or usurped by the counterfeit ministry of the papacy. Both views teach that something was replaced by something else, and both views agree that the something else is the papacy. The similarities stop here, however. Now, from what you were just stating and sharing in the chat, if Fulcrum 7 is now stating, as you proved, that the pagan view of the daily is a holdover from pre-1844 Millerite movement. And if they are saying that it is time for Adventists to move on, are they now not setting aside the understanding of the daily on which all of the pioneers were agreed? Uh, Brother Theodore, who is Falcom 7? Fulcrum 7 is a publication 
online of the Adventist Church, usually of the very conservative portion of the of the church. Yeah, it's not an official publication of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, but it's it, it's composed of, of thought leaders in the church. It's an independent kind of magazine. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. I called you Theodore. I apologize. That's and it's not a problem, William. I appreciate the input. Now, part of this, part of the issue that that I'm having is I'm looking at at all of these situations in these documents. We have multiple winds of doctrine that are blowing, right? And with these multiple winds of doctrine, we have situations that we need to consider carefully. Now, when Theodore was preparing to leave, he gave the recommendation that we should start at the beginning of these articles and see if we could establish exactly the position that the author is taking. Now, one of the comments, one of the quotes that was presented in the first article was a quotation from the E.A. Sutherland book, Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns. And from page 350, the following is quoted. Said a mother, two and two are what? The boy hesitated. The mother, surely you know that two and two make four. The boy, yes, mama, but I am trying to remember the process. The mother, process indeed. He then goes on to divine the process a little further. One day, Mary was bending over a tablet, writing words on both sides of a straight line, like multiplied numerators and denominators. What are you at now? asked Grandma. Mary answered with pride, I am diagramming. In the name of sense, what is diagramming? Mary replied, it is a mental discipline. Miss Cram says, I have a fine mind that needs developing. Look here, Grandma. Now, this is the correct placement of elements. Four score and seven are joined by the word and, a subordinate, connective, copulative conjunction. It modifies years, the attribute of time. Ago is a modal verb of past time. The root of the first clause is... Why, that's Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg. I keep it in my work basket and know it by heart. Indeed, well, ours is a simple personal, that's enough. If President Lincoln had brought up, been brought up on such stuff, that speech would never have been written. He called a noun a noun and was done with it. Now, in this situation, with the daily, in looking at the way that Mary would diagram this, if we're looking at Daniel 8, 13, we are seeing, then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto him, unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? So if we are dealing with the daily and the transgression of, of desolation, according to this, and is a subordinate, connective, copulative conjunction. It brings the two together. It joins the two. So you cannot have the daily without the desolation which makes abom uh, the abomination. Would that be clear? And can we agree on that? Now his quote here from Hebrews 10.9, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, this is showing that even in God's order, he takes away the first, and he establishes the second, and makes the point that this would be the same as taking away the old covenant, and replacing it with the new covenant. Okay. <clears throat> now, in the chat, we have 
this following, and I may ask I may ask for clarifications. To read it, Mark, understanding early writings as you do, I agree with you, will not persuade David. He has a different understanding as to what Ellen White meant by her statement in early writings regarding to the daily. I would refer you to my discussion with David under part two of his series. This was one other comment from me. There was one other comment from me and response from David that appears to have been deleted when David summed up our disagreement by stating, I believe the daily was paganism and that he did not so believe. Since David and I cannot agree at this point in time on what Ellen White meant in early writings by the daily, it is the end of the discussion. Now, here you say David Reed is the author. So David Reed is the author of the article that is published in Fulcrum 7. Would that be correct? Yeah, the four-part series. I think it's a four-part series. Okay. And the mark that he refers to? He was commenting earlier on in the comment section. Okay. Mark of... I'll find it. Not a problem. Now, as the author of this article is clear, <clears throat> in the account of Samson and the lion, it is worth noting that it was a young lion that came against him. He is trying to make the point that it should have been an old lion since paganism had been around long before, and that we have to know the time periods in which these things took place. <laughs> This almost sounds like a historical grammatical application. Would this be the way in which Father Miller would have approached his understanding if he were contributing at this point? I don't I don't think he would have said it should have been an old line. Okay. On that we're agreed. Now, he returned to his riddle and try and makes the point that this riddle should make more sense now. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. Out of the eater, the eater is Satan. And he uses 1 Peter 5, 8 as his anchor point, his proving ground for this. So if the eater is Satan, this portion stating out of the eater came forth meat, it would almost seem like it's being stated that out of Satan came the Bible. I have a problem with that. Okay, thank you for the clarification. It seems that Bruce Dewsbury is making the comment to Mark Shipowick regarding the author of the four-part series of articles in Fulcrum 7, which is David Reed. Now, just all the obligation as well. If the lion dies, so we have to maybe consider his feet in bed. Are you saying Very something, good. Stephen? Cut out. Well, I didn't hear that for some reason. I'm just saying. Want to say it again? Thompson, yeah, Thompson kills the lion. So he's, the uh, writer here is saying that the lion represents Satan. So. Does Satan die around the time of the daily or something, maybe? Well, Stephen, Stephen, you are you was thinking the same lines I was thinking. Okay. So in this in this situation, the application is not well presented. It seems that there is a confusion because if the eater is Satan. And Samson has now killed Satan. Then how is Satan continuing to create issues for us now? So his point is, or the, the point that he tries to press is that the honey comes from an unclean animal. And that lets us know that the honey is a false interpretation of God's word. Now, on the second portion of that passage, out of the strong, he wants to make the, the point 
that the strong are paganism, a system openly antagonistic and hostile toward Christianity, comes forth sweetness, papalism, a system based on paganism just as antagonistic, but clothed in religious garments. So when he attempts this to say that the riddle could be read as such, out of Satan came forth a false interpretation of God's word, making the way for his substitute, that is, out of paganism came forth papalism. Now, <clears throat> the next portion that he segues to, this sweetness of honey is a significant thing as it works with both truth and error. Just as God is able to breathe upon us his spirit, which contains light, power, and much love, joy, and peace, so Satan is able to breathe upon us his spirit, which also contains light and much power. Now, this reference is, <clears throat> is being provided from a vision that Mrs. White had seen, where there were some that were gathered in the holy place. Some continued to follow Christ into the most holy while others remained in the holy place. Those that remained in the holy place, Satan appeared before them. They did not know that they had changed leaders. Now, this is a, a point that I, I come back to multiple times. When Elder Jeff was making the decision that he was going to turn over Future for America to Parminder and Tess. I received a telephone call from an old friend that stated quite directly, we have a new leader. And unfortunately at that time, that statement was more telling than they thought. Now, the next combination was to try to bring in that in King Saul's day, when Jonathan tasted of the honey, his eyes were enlightened. This honey was of God, but Saul, leadership, had ordered that no man should eat. Therefore, it was withheld from the common people. Was it withheld from just the common people? Or was it a commandment of Saul to withhold the honey, to withhold the eating from all? So, in other words, his army, his generals, and the people. Now, we recognize that Satan is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But Christ is the Amen. lion. But Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Amen. Okay. Now, I refer to Satan as the lion lion. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your thought train. No, 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 no. I the the point of this, and this is for for everybody to hear. I encourage participation. I want. To I just interrupt some people in the middle of their thoughts, like just now. <laughs> no. But anyway, yeah, it's it's a good exercise and study for sure. Okay. Now, the next premise that's being introduced is that in looking at either view of the daily, it is necessary to submit them for examination to the book of Revelation. Now, at no point are we finding the daily specifically being referenced within Revelation, right? Sorry, the question again? Do we find the daily being specifically referenced within the book of Revelation? I'm not sure on that one. Uh, is it the three that are taken away, the three horns that are taken away or subdued? I don't know that I, I, I can see the three horns being taken away are a representation of the daily. Because the other seven horns continue, don't they? Yes, uh, wasn't it the three Aryan nations that were taken away, and that is the daily? What I'm saying is I believe that all ten of those horns were part of the pagan understanding. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I meant. But 
in Revelation, isn't it? The three horns that represent those three pagan, or not pagan, but they were Christian, but Aryan. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah. I, I, we, I, we tie down the daily being taken away to the year 508. And the pioneers of various understandings, that's the one, that's the event of 508. That was sort of marked up. Daily being taken away. And there has been recent studies, maybe in the last 20 hours a year, for some historians are putting the baptism of Clovis in 508. So, to me, that would be the event that uh, the Bible is pointing us to, because that had a great significance in establishing the papacy for the 1260s. If it hadn't been for the baptism of Clovis and his as a sign of his allegiance to the papacy, he set a president that was going to continue. I uh, know he didn't do that. May not may, may not have had that twelve sixty. So that that's the, that would be my understanding of the five of weight. Now I know I understand that the three powers were plucked up sort of within that time frame. Um, so there is some historical connections there, but that's not exactly what is being taken away. That's not what um, the daily being taken away is being identified with. Now, one of the things that I have been most grateful for has been the study that you you did, brother, that you entitled Tabled History. There are multiple points that I believe we're going to be able to clarify, to refine, and to understand because of that study. If any of us have not had access to this study, please let me know. Now, segueing as the author is, he makes the comment that in the progression of these articles, we will see that Revelation 12, 13, and 14 is the counterpart to Daniel 11, 31, and represents the results of the transgression of paganism as a persecuting power to that of papalism. And in addition, Revelation 12 and 13 detail the three persecuting powers of paganism, papalism, and the image to the beast or apostate Protestantism. Now, while this has a potential reference to the paganism as the daily, I'm having to consider carefully if his point is supportive of his original premise. Now, Revelation 12, 13, and 14 read, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, when she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the servant. Now, the comparison here with Daniel 11.31 that reads, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination which maketh desolate. Is the case made and is the case proven that Revelation 12, 13, and 14 is a counterpart to Daniel eleven thirty one? Has he established this con concretely? Now, the next portion is that he segues to state that it's very interesting to note that Uriah Smith, in his book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, changed two words in two seemingly different prophecies, one in Daniel and one in Revelation. Here again, I would ask what this has to do with the daily as paganism, whether it is proving it or disproving it, in the portion that he calls the conclusion. He observes that within Adventism, the current 
prevailing view is that the daily is not paganism, but is something else. In the conclusion, he attempts to lay further foundations. I have a problem when we're doing something like this, because if we have made our case, if we have made our point concretely and directly, we should not be using a conclusion to try to introduce other elements. Yet, at this point, he would like to go forward introducing Daniel 11.38 that states, but in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now, our situation within this, we had several presentations that were done about Daniel 11.38. One of the first ones that I recall was that, that Elder Jeff had presented that this God of forces or God of munitions or God's protectors needed to be more clearly understood. With this, the application is attempted to be made that when we apply the old view of the daily as paganism to Daniel 11.38, it will show us to understand the lineage of his fathers. These in turn allow us to correctly identify the God whom his fathers knew not. This is, the, this is true of the strange God in verse 39. As we progress, we will see how this works. And it will also be seen that the new view of the daily cannot provide those identities for us. Now, he wishes to segue from this next premise into an article dealing with the 300 foxes of Samson. So how do we see this? Has the case been made that the daily is paganism? Or has the case been made that the daily is something of God? Or has the status of this been left in the air? I don't think he proved either one of them. Thank you for your input. It's greatly appreciated. There's a lot yet to be shown. There's a lot yet to be presented. And some of what, what is going to be presented is not going to be a vanilla type, a pleasing address. It needs to be addressed in other ways so that we are able to help the reader or the hearer to reason for themselves from cause to effect. I appreciate what he's written here. I'm just not comfortable with the way in which this has been presented. Now, we will go on. We will open another one of the documents. Now, let's see if I can, if I get this open right. <clears throat> okay. Okay, can you see this now? <clears throat> it says part three, a tale of 300 foxes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Now, his opening statement is, as we have seen, it was popular and long established errors in the church that prevented both the Jews and the Millerites from arriving at a correct interpretation of their present truth from the book of Daniel. As with anything, there is a reason or a cause which produced those errors. In this article, we are going to turn our attention to what has changed in our principles of interpretation. Concerning the interpretation of Daniel 11, 31 to 45, our Adventist position is not much different from the other denominations. In fact, the closer we adhere to their methods of study, the closer will be our conclusions. To better understand this change of our position, the use of a Bible type will help us to gain a clearer perspective of the larger context. So, in turning our attention to what's changed in our principles of interpretation, I must ask the question, what is it that's changed? How are we to study the Bible today? If 
we choose to agree with the spirit of prophecy? Uh, we use uh, Mira's rules. Okay. Is there anything else that we should use? To the law and to the testimony. Okay. Line upon line. Okay. How else did Father Miller study? Didn't he use his Cruden's concordance? Yes, that's what he was using. Okay. Now, from the chat, I will read I will read this. It was just posted. From the comment section of the Daily in Daniel Part Two on Fulcrum Seven's website. Then I saw in relation to the daily, Daniel eight twelve, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom. So in this, the reference is being given to Daniel eight twelve. First mention would be excuse me. First mention would be Daniel eight eleven. Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment our cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united in the correct view of the daily. And this is early writings, pages 74 to 75. James White in The Coming and Kingdom of Our Lord Jesus Christ, 1870, page 108, repeated on pages 116 and 122, the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation represent Rome in its pagan and papal forms. David, I believe you are expressing something akin to what has been referred to as the new view in times past regarding the daily, stating that Jesus and Rome both take away the daily sacrifice is an attempt to hold and to keep the word sacrifice in the translation. Others holding this new view have included A.F. Ballinger, A.T. Jones, Leroy Edwin Froome, Desmond Ford, and far too many present-day SDAs. This is what I found Jack Sequera and A. Leroy Mo more in Adventism in conflict to be doing, attempting somehow to merge two conflicting views of an issue to establish a common unity. Such perhaps well-intentioned attempts to bring unity seldom and well in the long run. The context is critical because it shows that she was concerned about the time element of the 2300-day prophecy, not the meaning of the daily. Precisely, it would appear that there were some who were then trying to adjust the time element to explain their great disappointment. The daily, it seems, was being redefined in various ways to reset the start time of the 2300-day prophecy. The daily was not her focus in this quote from early writings, because when union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. What was that view? And then we have various quotes here from Sister White. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken as settling the matter. First Selected Messages, page 164. Ellen White does not want her writings to be the primary basis for any of our beliefs. Really, everything must have the scriptures as their foundations. Her writings are confirmatory and expedient expanditory of scripture. Again, she simply mentions that when Union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily while discussing the main issue of time. The daily was done, was a done deal in her mind, having already been established by the pioneers. There were far more pressing issues of the day to deal with than to be bogged down on an issue that had already been settled. A similar settlement statement appears in J. and Andrew's History of the Sabbath, page 265. 
Dr. Peter Havelin, says of those who choose Sunday, because our Savior rose from amongst the dead, so choose they Friday for another by reason of our Savior's passion and Wednesday on which he had been betrayed. Now, this was repeated. Though the focus of Andrew's argument in favor of the seventh-day Sabbath, the passing citation does not suggest an interesting does suggest an interesting thought when dealing with the three days nights issue and the Wednesday crucifixion crowd, seeing as modern Christians universally place the betrayal of Christ on Thursday night. I generally agree with your comments and article. It is your effort to combine Jesus and pagan Rome that is the issue for me. Now, there's quite a few of these that went through this portion in the chat. The point the final comment there by David Reed is uh, basically the substance of everyone's having trouble with, I think. Okay, so what David Reed said here, I think the daily in that statement from early writings mean the vision of the daily in Daniel 8.13, the answer to which is 2,300 days. The daily, as she used it in that statement, was simply shorthand for the 2,300 days. In other words, it is only the time prophecy that was ever settled. Okay, now I'm going to ask each, and if I have to, I will poll you. Do you agree that the daily is the subject of the vision of Daniel 8.13? No, no. Uh, The 2300 days is, not the daily. How long? Okay, my brother. Now I'm going to I'm going to ask this very specifically. How else does Daniel <clears throat> refer to the vision of the 2300 days using the time, English? time times and half a time is it or is that revelation? Okay. I think I, it's mentioned I think it's mentioned in Daniel eight more times. You may be correct. So let me let me ask you this, brothers and sisters. I need you, I need you to consider this this point carefully. Daniel 8:13 states that I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. The following verse reads, and he said unto me, now let's remember, this is in the English. If I approach this to you in French, German, or Spanish, it would be in a different form. But this says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yet, how would we see this in other languages? It would be expressed as unto 2,300 evening mornings. Have we not addressed this in the past? So not more specifically just evening and morning, rather than evenings and mornings. So in this, when he said unto me, Unto 2,300 evening morning, if we came down then to Daniel 8.26, comparing verse with verse, this verse reads, And the vision of the evening and morning, which was told is true, therefore shut thou up the vision for it shall be for many days. So in 826, the vision of evening and morning is a true vision. The word that is used there for vision is mare. Yet in that same passage, wherefore shut thou up the vision, the calzone. Now, when we compare this properly, with Daniel 8.13, Daniel 8.13 is addressing the vision, the calzone, 
concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. Does it make sense? Have I proved the point directly for you that we are speaking of two different visions, that the calzone of the daily and the transgression of desolation is separate from the vision, the mare of the 2300. Is your question kind of alluding to what establishes the vision? No, I'm not. That's not my question okay. at all. Okay. Help me out. My question is, from what I've just asked and from what we just compared, can you see that there are two different visions being addressed? Yeah, I forget how to explain it, but yes, as far as I understand. The vision in Daniel 8.13 is the calzone dealing with the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate. The vision in Daniel 8.14 is the mare. The vision which is true, the vision of the 2300 evening morning. I also think that the Hebrew would tell you that too. I agree. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, Mare and Mara. Okay, the Mare and the Mara are also different visions, but the Calzone cannot be. The mare. The mare can be part of the calzone, but it is not the calzone. To me, that's a, a mathematical point. Mm -hmm. and, and this point is actually very helpful and critical uh, for this uh, thing that's happening with so many ministries and understanding of the king of the north being Turkey. I mean, it really clears it up if you understand that 30-year period. Well, it just it helps so much. I think. Right now, the battle, the issue that has occurred between what is dubbed the American group and the Canadian group as to how the vision is established is quite important for us at this time, we cannot conflate, we cannot afford to combine the understandings of the Calzone, Mare, and Mara into a single entity. They are each different and they each offer a, an aspect to prophetic time and prophetic understanding that are necessary for us at this time. Now, the vision of Daniel 8.13, when it is clearly understood, when it is locked in to our mind, will help us to properly understand not only the king of the north and the king of the south, but will help us to understand how the visions, specifically the Calzone vision, can be established as we give these presentations. Now, it may be very necessary for us to examine this portion in fairly minute detail. Now, returning to this particular document, the author continued, in other words, it isn't about critiquing each individual method to see whether it passes muster, but to step back in order to see the system or the framework that has confined our theologians and our scholars. This system has removed from us the key that gives us a true understanding of Bible prophecy. This is shown in a very tangible way in types. And correspondingly, we see this system in Daniel 11, 38 to 41, and Revelation 13. 
as we begin to understand the types, we will also begin to under begin to gain clearer insights into the prophecy of Daniel 11. Now, this document is fairly short. We're talking four pages. The premise that was being made in the first document is to try to state that we have to have a proper understanding and a proper method to establish that understanding to rightly divide the word of truth. Much of what was being said in the second article did not establish a firm foundation. The thoughts were very scattered. The thoughts were not concretely placed to become a good foundation that would support the rest of the points that are trying to be made. Whether we find elements within this with the 300 foxes, I think we're going to have to first have a very firm understanding of what we are believing at this time for us to really establish how these examples are being currently used. So consider at this time <clears throat> what we have addressed so far today. If any have a difference or have a, a perspective that has not been addressed, please feel free to share. Now, we are within a few minutes of the close of our time together today. Are there any other thoughts or questions regarding what we have been addressing and regarding what we have talked about within today's study. Okay, shall we then close our study with a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to discuss, to learn, and to be directed by you and by your angels and your spirit. Help us each one today. Guide us so that which we do may bring glory to your name. I pray, Father, for each one that has been in this study. I pray for those that were not able to attend the study, that you will watch over them, bring us back again together, so that we may more fully understand that which you are trying to teach us. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.